Hey friend, thanks for joining us. We have an amazing study ahead of us. We're gonna be looking in the book of Titus. You know, the Apostle Paul, though he had won many people to Christ, established many churches, only had three sons in the faith in the sense that he called them sons. There's only three people in the whole Bible that have the designation from the Apostle Paul as being a son in the Lord. One is Timothy, another is Onesimus, and the third one is Titus. And we're going to be looking at some things from the book of Titus that are going to be practical, they're going to be helpful for your life, for my life. We had a great time in church with this teaching. And so listen, if you've got a Bible, grab it. Got a pencil, you know, and a paper, grab it. If you've got an, an iPad or some electronic device, you've got the Bible downloaded on it, got a notepad on there, get ready because we're going to get into the Word of God together. In fact, I'd like you to take a moment and just pray. In fact, whatever you're doing, maybe just, just take a, a little time out and let's make the Word of God first place. Let's concentrate on the Word right now and let's allow it to find a home in our hearts. Will you pray with me? Father, we ask for understanding as we study your Word today. Pray that you'd give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to comprehend, and Father, it is our intent to not just be those that applaud your word, but we want to be those that apply your word. We're going to be doers of the word of God, and we know from your promise that we will be blessed in the doing. So friend, I want you to get ready. Um, you're going to find something that, that will bless you, but something you can put into practice, something that you can do. So let's get into the book of Titus right now and uh, be hearers and then doers of the Word of God. Titus, a, uh, an epistle, a letter, a book of the New Testament. You know, when you read the epistles or the letters of the New Testament, in some ways it's like reading someone else's mail. In a way, it gives you insight into the writer, also into the congregation or congregations that those letters were written to. But at the same time, it has practical application for the church and for our personal lives today because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for instruction, for reproof, etc., etc. And though it was perhaps written to a church, you know, 1900 years ago or whenever it was, it's as applicable today as it was then. Now, there's certainly always going to be some cultural nuances that it's good to understand the audience it was written to. But because it is breathed of God, it is eternal and it is still pregnant with God's life. Uh, the book of Titus was written by the Apostle Paul to a young minister named Titus around 66 A.D. The book is referred to as one of Paul's pastoral epistles, along with 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy that have also been given that designation. And they're so-called because they deal with the responsibilities of the person that stands in the position and calling of pastor. Both Titus and Timothy were in positions of leadership in the church, and both of them were converts of Paul. Interesting thing to note, though Paul, you know, preached the gospel and had multitudes saved, in the scripture, there's only three people that he refers to as his sons. Only three people that have that distinct designation. And it would be a very profitable study on your own to study the lives of these three men. One was Titus. The other was Timothy, and the third was Onesimus. And uh, you find him mentioned in a couple of different places, specifically, though, in the book of Philemon. Uh, the epistles were written to them, and they're unique in that they were written to individuals about the challenges of church organization and church function. They teach how to select people, to choose people for specific positions, dealing with gifting and character. And it's interesting if you note some of those things, and uh, you know we'll get into some of them, when God gives qualifications for someone for ministry, 
Gifting is at the very small end of the scale. In fact, there might be one or two references to gifting, and there's a myriad of references to character. Unfortunately, that's been flip-flopped in the church today. If someone has gifting, we tend to overlook character. But there'll be like 12 or 13 references to character and maybe one or two references to gifting. And so uh, Paul, in writing to Titus, as well as Timothy, and his, the epistles that bear his name deals with those things as well as a number of others. Also, much attention is given you know, to, to their personal integrity. Now, as well as being referred to as a pastoral epistle, it's also referred to by many as the book of good works because that is one of the predominant themes here in Titus. And I want to look at some of the verses, not all of them, just real quickly that deal with this theme of good works. And you'll understand why it's called that. Look in chapter 2 and verse 7. He said, In all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. Verse 14, same chapter who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Chapter 3, verse 1, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey, to be ready for every good work. Uh, verse 8 of chapter 3, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. And then verse 14 of that same chapter. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. All right, be zealous of good works. Maintain good works. Be ready for good works. Good works, good works, good works. But Paul, in writing to Titus, also makes it very clear that good works are not a means to salvation. Look in chapter 3 and verse 4. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Good works do not save us. They're important. They're mentioned again and again and again in this epistle, and Titus was to pass all of this on to the congregations that he was overseeing. But good works are to be the fruit of salvation, not the root of salvation. Good works are the result of salvation, not the means of salvation. You think of a man like Cornelius, mentioned in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius, the Bible said he feared God with all of his household. He had a genuine respect and reverence for God, taught his house to reverence God. The Bible says he prayed always, that he gave alms generously. He took care of the poor. Man, this guy's got a good heart. He prays to God so much so that his alms deed, his, his praying came up as a memorial in heaven before God. So he fears God. He gives. He prays. But he's not saved. The angel comes to him and says, you need to sin. For Simon, Peter, he's by the seaside. He's going to come tell you words whereby you and your household will be saved. Salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, this book was written to Titus, who at the time was on the island of Crete. And Paul wrote it from more than likely somewhere in Macedonia. And the churches that it deals with, and there was a number of churches on the island of Crete there, a number of, of fellowships, they had passed from the pioneering stage. They'd become somewhat developed, somewhat established, and Titus himself was a Greek. He was born of Gentile parents. He was converted by the Apostle Paul, and he did a lot of traveling with Paul. And when Paul and Barnabas went to Jerusalem to discuss the salvation of the Gentiles, they took Titus with them as an example of a Gentile saved by faith apart from the works of the law, apart from circumcision. And I want you to keep your place here and look with me, if you would, in Galatians. I want to get a little bit of background on Titus. Galatians chapter 2. 
And this really is significant, not just because the epistle was written to him, but it's significant from the viewpoint of church history. Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who are of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Now, we read that and say, okay, you know, what's the big deal? Well, it was a huge deal. Look with me, if you would, in the book of Acts, chapter 15, which actually corresponds with what we just read here in Galatians. Acts, chapter 15. We want to pick it up in verse 1. It says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. I want to stop there. Paul and Barnabas have just gotten back from their first missionary journey. They've gone out through the Gentile world and established churches, won converts. They've come to their, back to their home church in Antioch that for the most part is a Gentile church. And these guys come from the church at Jerusalem and they show up and they start telling all of these converts, they begin to tell everyone in the church, you guys are not really saved. You think you're saved, but you're not. You have to be circumcised. You have to keep the law of Moses. Otherwise, you're not really a Christian. You're not accepted by God. Verse 2 says, Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, it's necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. So that's the same thing that we read there in, in Galatians. And, and here's the deal. Titus was apparently brought along as living proof that a Gentile could be saved without being circumcised, which is not a real delightful thought when you're a grown man in the first place, and that a Gentile could be saved without keeping the law of Moses. Now, these guys that had come down from the church at Jerusalem became known as Judaizers. And again, they said it wasn't possible to be saved except through the law of Moses. You had to keep the law of Moses, embrace Judaism, get circumcised, become a Jewish proselyte, and then only through the doorway of Judaism, could you come to Christ and become a real Christian? So they came to the church in Jerusalem. And this chapter 15 that we've just read is referred to as the very first church council. James presided. He apparently was the lead pastor, the lead elder there at the church at Jerusalem. And as you read the story, read on, apparently he's the one that had the final say. And the conclusion was, all right, Gentiles can be saved apart from circumcision and without keeping the law of Moses. And it's significant because it affected millions of Gentiles. If this had not happened, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ would have remained a tiny Jewish sect until this very day. The question of legalism was once and for all settled here, a turning point in church history, and Titus was the proof. That just lets me know this guy must have been some sort of an outstanding Christian. And Titus went on to become Paul's troubleshooter. Paul would send him to straighten out churches and that had huge moral problems and, and, you know, leadership problems, and he would send them to organize things and, and get the problems taken care of. 
He was sent to Corinth in connection with the problems of morality there, and it was no small thing. There's a guy that's taken his stepmother away from his father, and he's sleeping with his stepmother and just openly flaunting it in the church, and nobody's doing anything about it. Everybody's afraid to touch it. And Paul says, man, this is going to affect the whole church. This is like leaven. The whole church is going to be filled with immorality. This isn't dealt with. And guess who he sends in connection with that issue? Well, he sends Titus. Also sends him there in connection with receiving an offering for the poor saints in Jerusalem. In fact, look with me, if you would, at 2 Corinthians. We'll eventually get to Titus. Don't worry. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, if you would. 2 Corinthians the seventh chapter, finding out who this letter was written to. Uh, this is, what we're about to read is directly after Paul addresses them and acknowledges that they've repented for not dealing with the sin and they've gotten all of that, you know, the moral issue straightened out for the most part. And we come to verse 13 of chapter 7. He says, therefore... We've been comforted in your comfort, and we rejoiced exceedingly, more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I'm not ashamed, but as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true, and his affections are greater for you, as he remembers the obedience of you all, and with Fear, how with fear and trembling you received him. Apparently the church at Corinth had gained a great bit of respect for Titus. And Paul had great confidence in him as, as well. Chapter 8 and verse 23, look what he says. If anyone inquires about Titus, he's my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. And he's my partner. He's my fellow worker. He's a messenger. Literally, he's an apostle to the churches. Look in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. Just a few more verses here. Verse 15. Paul said, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. But be that as it may, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with cunning. Did I take advantage of you by any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus and sent our brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? Can you see the confidence that just radiates out of the Apostle Paul when it comes to Titus? He's writing about him. He's my, he's my partner. He's my fellow laborer. You know, I was encouraged by him. You guys were encouraged by him. And I know he didn't take advantage of you, just like I didn't take advantage of you. Paul had reproduced himself in his son Titus, and we need to reproduce ourselves in others as well. Uh, between Paul's first and his second Roman imprisonments, it's believed that he sailed to Crete with Titus, and he left Titus there to straighten out and organize the church. And this letter was written sometime later. Go ahead and turn back to the book of Titus, if you would. Uh, Crete is a large island, in case you don't know it, in the Mediterranean Sea, located southeast of Greece. It's about 150 miles long and maybe 35 miles wide at its widest point. The people made their living off of fishing and off of shipping. Very mountainous region. And Crete was probably one of the first places in the world that heard the gospel. In the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, and everyone's speaking in tongues, and they went from the upper room, the 120 did down onto the street, and people said, oh, you know, they're drunk. What are these idiots doing? And Peter stands up and preaches about Jesus. And we're given a specific list of people that were there that heard the gospel for the very first time, heard the very first sermon ever preached in the body of Christ by a member of the body of Christ. Peter preached it on that day, and he preached about Jesus, 
And the scripture specifically says that there were Cretans present. People from the Isle of Crete that heard them speak in their own tongue and in their own language. And no doubt they would have taken that message with them back to the island of Crete. And you can find that if you're taking notes in Acts chapter 2 and verse 11. Now, ancient writers also tell us that the Cretans were known for their greed, for their belligerence, the fact that they liked to fight, for their fondness of drinking, and their habitual lying. In fact, the Greeks coined a special verb for lying. They called it to cretinize. It meant you were lying. If you were cretinizing, you were lying. And so people have gotten saved there. There's a church. But apparently, a lot of people in the church were hot-headed. They were unruly. And it would take someone very special to get them in line. So who does Paul send? Titus. Look in Titus chapter 1, verse 12 says, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So Paul leaves him there and later wrote him this letter that we're studying. Now, how many would like to be the pastor over that bunch? Titus, Titus had some things going on. So let, let's begin with verse 1. In fact, I want to read Titus verses 1 through 4. And the reason I want to read them without stopping is because in the original Greek text, verse 1 through 4 is all one sentence. Paul was not big on punctuation. <laughs> Titus 1 and 1. Paul, a bondservant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness, and hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, a true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. All right, let's break those verses down and begin to talk to them. Paul begins by identifying himself as a bond servant or a bond slave of God. The Greek word is doulos, which literally means one that has given himself completely to the will of another. One whose will has been swallowed up by the will of another. And it also carries with it the thought of being completely dependent upon that one whose will you will completely yield to and completely serve. So Paul identifies himself, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. My will is to do his will. My interests are secondary to his interests. And I am totally and completely dependent upon him. Now, before Paul said he was an apostle, which was the next thing he said, he said that he was a bondservant, that he was sold out to God and dependent upon God. There are a lot of people today that would like a title like apostle or bishop or whatever. A lot of people want authority, but they don't want to sell out first. Listen, the way up in God's kingdom is down. The person that humbles themselves, God will exalt them. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. But you'll find a lot of the people, they revel in the authority, but they're not too big on being a servant. Jesus said these words, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. He said to his disciples, the one that's going to be chief among you is going to be servant of all.
friend, I trust that you got something out of that that's helped you in your life. You're going to have to join us next week as we continue on in the book of Titus. And I just want to take a moment and, and share something with you. You know, if you've been blessed by the broadcast, if this has been spiritual food for you, if you've, you've received anything from it, I want to encourage you uh, to be a part of taking the broadcast to someone else. I think some people assume that we've just got all sorts of money and, and we're doing this. Listen, we have to trust God every day. In fact, there have been several regions of the world where we've had to take the broadcast off because we didn't have the money to continue. And when we did take it off, we got letters from tons of people in those areas said, why did you go off the air? You know, we loved it. Now we don't have anything. Well, my thought was, why didn't you ever help support it? You know, why, why didn't you do something? Because, you know, we don't get on and talk about money a lot. And so I think because of that, people assume that we've just got all sorts of money. But, but it is a, a, a matter of, of trust for us. We're going forward in faith as we do this. And it's just not consistent with my DNA and, and with what we believe we should do to get on and make big pitches for finances. This is probably the biggest thing I've ever done right here. But uh, truly, the only way that we can carry it on is when people become partners with us. And if you never have, why not begin to sow something consistently so that other people in your region or another region of the world can receive the Word of God through the Answers broadcast. We're on in hundreds of countries in, in multiple languages, bringing a living Jesus to a dying world. Be a partner with us. We'll see you next time. Where is your hope? That's a question that deserves an answer. Finding answers to cope with the stress of the daily grind is difficult, but that is why Answers with Bayless Conley is here, on air with you right now, bringing our living Savior to our dying world, revealing hope to the lost, bringing answers to life's deep and most difficult questions. Today, we are asking you to play a vital role in reaching our world with the hope of Jesus Christ through your support. And to thank you for your support, we would like to send you a copy of Pastor Bayless Conley's powerful booklet, Footprints of Faith. The Bible tells us to walk in the footprints or to follow the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham has had. And he's actually left several very distinct footprints in the sands of time. That if you'll follow his faith and the pattern of his faith, you can have the same type of results that he had. This is going to help you. Call the toll-free number on the screen or visit AnswersBC.org to get your copy. Again, for your gift to help us take our living Savior to a dying world, we'll send you a copy of Footprints of Faith to help you grow in faith with this easy-to-read book. Call today. Thank you for helping reach the lost and hurting with the answers they long for. Answers found in Jesus Christ.